Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Roger Nygaard, director of the documentary The Nature of Existence, and play previously unreleased clips of an interview Nygaard conducted for that film with the late Irvin Kirshner, director of the best Star Wars film ever, The Empire Strikes Back. Stick around. The Force is definitely with us today. Hey, did you know that you can listen to the latest Mr. Media on your phone with the Stitcher app? Stitcher is smart radio for your smartphone. Mr. Media is on demand and on the go with Stitcher. Download Stitcher for your phone today. Get the free download at Stitcher.com. That's S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R.com. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You know, MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Stop by and check it out. There are nearly 700 archived celebrity interviews for your listening pleasure. The show is brought to you today by our new sponsor, Star Pirates. Star Pirates is a free online sci-fi game that I think you'll really enjoy playing. Give it a try today at www.starpirates.net. Now, you must be at least 13 to play, which was a close one for me. Again, that's starpirates.net. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of Wookiees, Stormtroopers, and droids other than the ones you're looking for in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. The force is within every one of us. It's using the most powerful parts of our system. We have a big brain that isn't used. We don't know its potential because no one has ever pushed it to the limit. You might say to someone like Isaac Newton, you might say to somebody like Einstein, there are many, many men who have pushed it pretty far. Even Nietzsche, who I think is fantastic as a philosopher, they pushed it pretty far. But nobody has really taken advantage of the human brain. And there's your answer. The DVD of The Nature of Existence hit stores just before the late November 2010 death of Irvin Kershner, who was the beloved and respected director of the first and best Star Wars sequel, The Empire Strikes Back. Nygaard, director, Roger Nygaard, director of The Nature of Existence, interviewed Kershner for his documentary, and we asked him to return to our show and share some outtakes from his interview. The nature of existence is a far more serious study, perhaps, than the works for which Nygaard was previously best known, Trekkies, and its sequel, Trekkies II. But, honestly, it's just as much fun and just as entertaining. And you can order a copy of the Nature of Existence DVD right now at a great price at MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Roger Nygaard, welcome back to Mr. Media. Hi, good. Thanks. It's fun to be here. Glad to have you. We enjoyed having you the first time. And i got to ask you... um, Tell folks just a little bit about how this film came together before we start uh, with the, the, the clips of Irvine. Well, I had my own personal existential crisis that began maybe when I was seven years old. And decades later, that obsession with existentialism finally intersected with my filmmaking. And I realized I could interrogate my friends about all these questions and issues that I had. And I had started doing that, and I thought, why not put it on film? So I started interviewing my friends and asking them the the questions that I was wrestling with. Why do we exist? What is our purpose? What is religion? Define the word God. What is faith, truth, the soul, the afterlife? Is there a heaven? Where exactly is it located, etc.? And as I interviewed my friends, I realized I needed to sort of broaden the circle. So I began researching and contacting other people like scientists and religious leaders. And I didn't limit myself to to the religious and philosophical experts. I also broadened it to kind of the whole spectrum of, of, of humanity, including my neighbor's daughter, for instance, wrestlers, pizza chefs, and film directors. And Irvin Kirshner is someone who consented to an interview. And he is, I would have to say, one of my favorite people that I interviewed for, in making this film. It's interesting, as people will hear in a, few, in a moment or two, when you hear his voice... Uh, and knowing, sadly, that he's talking to us, you know, he's no longer with us, he has this 
this great voice. Uh, it's just uh, – I was listening to it again this morning and thinking, it's kind of eerie. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a, just a great voice, and he's talking to us about, as folks will hear, about beliefs and religion and the afterlife. Um, we, uh, we opened with a, a clip of him talking about the force. Uh, it's just uh, – it sends chills up my spine to hear him talking about these things. You know, he he was a teacher. He was George Lucas's teacher, mm-hmm. and and he speaks with authority. And when I interviewed him, I think that that authority was underlined by the fact of his age. I think the older someone gets, the more definitive they become, and the less they care what people think about their opinions, and the more they're willing to speak truth. Mm-hmm. And I felt like Urban Kirshner was was speaking truth to me from his heart, from what he truly believed. At the end of the interview, I mean, he was sort of nervous about, you know, I've said a lot of things here I've never said before, and I'm a little worried about, you know, maybe I was a little too forthright, and so I and Mo Ramshandani, who is one of the associate producers on my film, who introduced me to Urban, we assured Urban that we would we'd take great care with what he said and how he, you know, he was portrayed in the movie, and I sent him a copy of the film, of course, you know, and, and uh, uh, kept him in the loop. Hmm. I like when he talked about the force, he talked about we have a big brain, which reminded me of uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino's uh, film uh, Pulp Fiction, where uh, Sam Jackson says to uh, John Travolta, uh, check out the big brain on Brad, you know, making fun of some guy that they're about to blow away. Uh, anyway, I got a kick at it. I don't think he had uh, Pulp Fiction in mind when he said it. You know, we're, But um, let's, uh, let's talk about some of these clips. Um, uh, starting with um, – he talks about truth. Um, he said – you asked him about truth and he said um, – the thing I really like, what people will hear him say is, if if I knew truth, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a constant search and that's part of the, the, the film I made and a big part of the film – is how do you know truth? How do you find truth? How do you discern it from all the information that, that's bombarding us every day? So I asked everybody, and I asked Urban, you know, about truth. What is truth? What is truth? If I knew what truth was, I wouldn't be talking to you now. I'd be sitting down and writing great, great books about truth. And that's what Spinoza tried to do, and Kant, and all the great philosophers. They were looking for truth. And I think they all found that there was no truth. Truth is is the extreme quality of, of, uh, let's say, of uh, investigation. And investigation is what truth is about. In other words, why talk about truth unless it's tied to something specific? I want to know the truth about what? About the universe? Oh, I'll study cosmology. I want to know the truth about uh, what makes life? Well, I'll study zoology, botany, I'll study the uh, physiology, I'll study all these things and get to get closer to some element of truth. But the concept of truth in a religious sense, there's no such thing. You can't prove anything, you can't see it, smell it, hear it. So what therefore is truth? Truth is as relative as anything else in life. It's relative. You can, if you're with other people who believe the way you do, you've got the truth. If you're with people who don't believe the way you believe, it ain't the truth. It's relative. And that's, that's for some people the curse of life that they can't find one thing that settles them down and says, this is what it's all about. No. Only art comes close to trying to, I said trying, to answer truth. 
We're back. We're talking to um, Roger Nygaard about his film, The Nature of Existence, and playing these clips from one of his interviews with, uh, or from his interview with Irvin Kirstner, uh, director of uh, the Star Wars sequel, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, another one, uh, you talked to him about hope, and he said, <laughs> "This was I love I love this." He said, "Hope is a stupid concept." <laughs> <laughs> wow, you know, good point. Well, it's sort of like wishing and praying and hoping for something as opposed to actually doing something about it. If you're going to sit somewhere and hope things get better, you're at the mercy of whatever happens. Isn't it better to go out and and, and make something happen? And maybe it helps, though, if it kind of psychs you up to do something. I mean, that's maybe one benefit of prayer, for instance. It's really self-motivational, positive talk. And if it has an effect, if it has a positive effect, great. But I think the point is, go out and do something. We all are adrift in a very complex universe. In our lives, it's very difficult to know what we never know what's coming next. We don't really see clearly what's around us. And suddenly, here is somebody who comes along and says, I've got the answers for you. Well, people want answers. People want something definite in their lives, something to hold on to. Something to give them hope. Now, hope is a stupid concept because why hope? You either do something about a problem. If you hope about it, nothing will happen. Oh, I hope I'll be a rich man someday. Nothing will happen to you. But to work at it, you might become rich. So religion offers hope. Now, tell us a little bit of how you phrase the questions, because we have the answers. We have uh, Irvin Kirstner's answers. Uh, the next one we have is um, Irvin on belief, and he, he, he says in this, he says, belief is amorphous. But, pardon me, what we don't know is, what, 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 you know, how would you have phrased that to him? Would you just said, talk about belief, or would you have set it up? It was more a question of, why do people believe what they believe? Hmm. And I had sub questions too, and it really falls under the religion category in one respect. You know, um, should religions be challenged, and what does fear have to do with belief? And do we really need to believe? Why do we need to believe in something? And where does belief come from? I, I have you know a series of questions that I would ask people, and some of the answers drew you know they would bear more fruit than others, and so that would make the cut of the movie sometimes, hmm. and other times. You just never know what's going to work with an interviewee, what it is that they have a particular idea or a bone to pick, you know. And, and so uh, in this case, you get to hear what Irvin's thing is when it comes to belief. People get angry when you challenge their belief because they're holding on to something totally irrational. A belief is always irrational. A scientist will never talk about belief. It's either yes or no, it's measurable or not measurable, but belief is uh, it's amorphous. And if somebody says, hey, what you believe, you've got to look at because it doesn't stand up to scrutiny, they get very angry because you're shaking the foundation of their life. Now, if they can get over that, then suddenly the life can become much richer. A little more scary, maybe, but richer. Well, let's take a, uh, let's take a quick break. This is Bob Andelman, and you're listening or watching the Mr. Media Radio interview with Roger Nygaard, director of the documentary film The Nature of Existence. And we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Julie Bowen, and I am a face of influenza. Health officials now recommend everyone, everyone six months of age and older get immunized against influenza this and, and every year. We all are faces of influenza. Vaccination is safe and is the best way to help protect yourself and your family. The American Lung Association urges everyone six months of age and older, and we, we mean everyone. Everyone, everyone, to get vaccinated. Visit facesofinfluenza.org. 
Now, this is the amazing Kreskin. If you could read my thoughts, you'd know you're listening to Mr. Media Radio. Well, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media interview with Roger Nygaard, the director of The Nature of Existence, and we're playing clips from his interview with the late film director, uh, Irvin Kirshner. Um, This is a longer clip. Uh, This is about five minutes. I want to prepare you for this. This is Irvin talking about how he got to Hollywood, uh, meeting Ansel Adams, how Roger Corman basically got him started in the business, and how things went from there. So this is, uh, again, this is Irvin Kirshner, the director of Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. I went to high school in Philadelphia at what we called a slum school, South Philadelphia High. I went into the Army, in the Air Force, for three and a half years in the European theater, and sometimes flew bombers and did other work. I came back and decided I no longer wanted to be a musician, which is what I was my whole childhood. I composed, I played the violin and viola, and this was my life. But I decided, after the experience of the war, that uh, I would not be a musician. And I thought I should become an artist, a painter. And so I went uh, and enrolled at Temple University in Philadelphia, and they had one of the finest art schools in the East, the Tyler School of Fine Arts. I began my official studies there. Then I uh, went to New York, which was inevitable, and studied with Hans Hoffman, who was the great teacher at that time of all the, the, the people who became the abstract expressionists of the 50s and 60s. From there, I decided to go uh, to California and enter the Art Center School that I heard had great courses in art and photography. And so I just about got here in an old jalopy and got accepted by the school, showed them my work, and suddenly became a photographer. I got to meet Brett Weston, the old man Weston, Ansel Adams, some of the really great Steichen, some of the really great photographers, and decided this is what I wanted to do. And after Art Center School, I, uh, I started teaching at USC in the cinema department, but I was teaching still photography, the art of photography. And... Uh, I became friendly with the dean, Slavko Vorkopich, a really great man in Hollywood. And he became an influence on me, and he said, why don't you take some cinema courses while you're here? And then he said the magic words, and it's free because you're teaching. And so I closed my business and began to take courses, which I took for two terms in cinema, and then went to Iran to do films, documentaries uh, for the U.S. Information Service. And that started a whole documentary experience in Greece and Turkey and Iraq and Iran and Lebanon, until I came back here and started a very important TV show called Confidential File. In it, we looked at the problems of the city of Los Angeles. Later, we spread out to the problems in cities in the United States. And I think it was the forerunner to 60 Minutes and those types of shows. We were the first ones. After three years of doing that, of shooting everything, of directing everything, of editing everything, I uh, decided it's time to make a feature, and I took my stuff all over Hollywood, and they laughed at me. 
They said, well, this is, uh, this is not motion pictures. This is little documentaries. Uh, no one took documentaries seriously at that time. And so I said, okay, then I'll make my own film and wrote a script with a friend of mine. And we raised $22,000 and made the, the picture. We had $10,000 put into it by Roger Corman. And he saved the project from going under. Well, we made the film and Roger then took it for us to Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers immediately bought it. I got myself a uh, first payment of 150000 I felt I was as rich as I'll ever be. And they gave me a seven-year contract to direct. After one year of sitting in the ex Elia Kazan's offices and reading their scripts and listening to Hollywood talk, I quit and walked out of the studio and I said, this isn't for me. And I began the saga of trying to make independent pictures in Hollywood. And I can only advise any young people, don't do it because it's a killer. <laughs> they don't want you. Yeah, it was good. It was kind of lucky at the time I didn't realize that he was going to give me such an extensive bio when I just asked. Because I ask every interview interviewee, you know, tell me your name and your occupation and a little bit about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I got really a very interesting and, and long story about how Irvin got to be who he is. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Uh, you know, his Roger Corman stuff was, was really interesting. It's like, you know... Who who knew? You know, and, and Roger Corman has touched so many lives from, you know, Scorsese uh, to uh, Jim Cameron and, and, you know, a million people in between. I did Being not know. a filmmaker myself, you know, I didn't want to stop him. I, I could have <laughs> listened to him go on for hours about that. It's probably a part of you wishing that you had at this point. Um, another great uh, moment with uh, Irvin uh, is when he talks about happiness. And he says... <laughs> He says life is difficult unless you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. I mean, that's clearly one of my favorite quotes ever, and we put it in our trailer because for that reason, because it really sums things up too. Because people they have this idea that they should be pursuing happiness, the pursuit of happiness, right? But it's happiness is kind of a false goal. Julia Sweeney talked about this too in the film The Nature of Existence. How happiness is a byproduct of having a purpose in your life. It's not a goal you pursue in itself. It's, you can't pursue an emotion. You pers pursue activities and side effects of those activities are emotions. So the real question is, what is your purpose in life? And so when I asked Irvin Kirshner, you know, how do we find happiness? You get his response. Nobody can really be happy. You can have moments of happiness, moments of joy. But life is very difficult, unless you're a total idiot, then you can be happy. So if you want to shut down the reality of life and stop living it fully, uh, you can be happy. But that's idiocy. But if you're going to live a full life, then all you can hope for is moments of happiness, moments. Remember, there is a chemical nature also to happiness. And the genes make some people pessimistic and some uh, optimistic. It's built into the genes very often. Well, let's take one more quick break. Uh, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Radio interview with Roger Nygaard, director of The Nature of Existence. And we'll be right back. This is a public disservice message from the National Lampoon Radio Hour. Don't waste your evenings doing volunteer work at your local mental hospital. Remember, even if you do, the crazy people there will probably think you didn't. Hey, folks, this is Mark Marin from the podcast WTF. And really, why are you listening to Mr. Media Radio? Uh, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Radio interview with Roger Nygaard, director of The Nature of Existence. And we're going through and playing some clips uh, from his interview with Irvin Kirshner, himself the director of The Empire Strikes Back. Tell us a little bit about where you are right now. You're, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're in an editing bay, but I, I also know that it's a little unusual editing, editing bay. 
Yeah, I'm at, uh, well, it's an editing bay where I'm working on a TV show called Curb Your Enthusiasm, mm. and it's season eight. So Larry David could walk in that door at any second, I should warn you, but in the meantime, uh, <laughs> we've got a few minutes to chat. Very good. Is this the first uh, you've worked on this, or have you been doing this for a while? It's the third season I've worked on the show. I actually started working with Larry season six, and so last time around, season seven, was the Seinfeld reunion season. Mm. And season eight is going to be uh, hilarious, too. I saw a clip uh, where we have Cheryl uh, coming up to the door, so we're hopeful of seeing more of her this season. Um, oh, you will. Yes, you will. Excellent. Um, all right, let's, talk, let's return to the subject of uh, Irvin Kirshner. Uh, the next topic was morality, and I think you asked him, what is morality? And, and, and one of the things he says is that it's a way of thinking that makes it easier to live with people. That to me is one of the big questions. It's like where does our morality come from? Why do we do good things? And the Christian doctrine is one of humans are born bad, the original sin. They're tainted by original sin, and so they have to struggle to be good. But that is counter to what anthropologists or uh, evolutionists may, may argue, that People are born basically good because in order to live in a group, to live in societies with other people, you have to be altruistic. You have to be able to trade favors. You have to be able to cooperate with each other. Otherwise, a group cannot function together as a group, and there's safety in numbers. So it's better for survival if you can live in a group. So they argue that morality comes out of that innate need to be able to cooperate with each other, and religion just put a name on it. And uh, you know, sort of claimed it as their own. So those are the two sort of competing arguments. And when I ask people, what is morality? Where does morality come from? I got a range of answers, uh, including this one you'll hear from Irvin Kirshner. You, you asked me, what is morality? Morality is a uh, a way of thinking that makes it a little easier to live with people and for people to live with you. It's a catchword, and it's a sweet word, morality, unless it's used by uh, people who know what's moral and who know what's immoral, and only they know the truth of morality. Then it's, it's, uh, it's another prison to be in. So, Roger... Uh one of the remaining topics that you asked uh, Irvin Kirshner about was the Bible, and uh, he seemed very interested in this. He talked about all the things in the in the Bible that the uh, e- uh, evangelists uh, tend to avoid talking about: uh, incest, massacres, slaves, uh, uh, Jericho. Um, he says that they uh, they never discuss the tough parts of the good book. Well, yeah, that was another topic, you know, that I asked people and. and- What's interesting to me is scripture. How does something become scripture? And then once it does, how do we continue to accept it even though culture changes? The book stays the same then. And one of the questions I asked is, how do we accept a holy book that positively portrays unacceptable behaviors, such as slavery and incest and murder, which the Bible is full of? And it's not... Uh, always shown as like this is bad it's shown as this is stuff that God sanctioned so how and of course Irvin's going to talk about in his answer how that we like to focus on the nicer stories in the Old Testament or the Torah or take your pick your holy book so can we take what we like about a religion or a belief system and make a version that works for ourselves, or can we ignore parts of our holy book or our scripture whatever it may be and if you do are you still actually a member of that can you be defined as a member of that religious group if you're deciding what's right and what's wrong you're saying you're smarter than God <laughs> and so who gets to decide so anyway I asked Irvin Kirshner too you know to talk about the origin of the holy books and and the uh, why people do or don't uh, follow some parts of it all right, and here's what he had to say. I listen to evangelists on TV, and they never quote those parts of the Bible which are kind of kind of difficult to justify. Uh, be kind to your slaves. You know, there weren't ten commandments. There were dozens of commandments. 
that were sifted down by the religious orders and finally came down to ten. But, my God, incest, massacres. Do you know what happened to, you know, uh, was it Joan who fit the Battle of Jericho? He was sent by his father, I think it was Isaac, to go and tear down the walls of Jericho, these unbelievers, and to destroy the soldiers. He went and he circled. And must have been an earthquake. Anyway, the walls came down by themselves because he didn't have the means of battering a wall down. He went in and massacred the soldiers. He came back. He says, the deed has been done, Father. Uh, Jericho is no more powerful. He said, "Mm -hmm. mm-hmm. What happened to the women and children? Oh, they're there. Well, they're going to be warriors. Go back and finish the job. This is in the Bible. He goes back and massacres every human being in Jericho. Do you ever hear about this from these missionaries and people? It's in the Bible. Do you ever hear about the incest and how David threw out his daughter because his son had incest with her. And of course he believed that she incited him. Not that he just wanted her because she was a great beauty and she went into the streets. That's in the Bible. Roger, one of the things I was wondering is um, one of the next topics uh, we have is um, you asked about how to improve humanity. And I wondered if uh, if Irvin's uh, discussion his comments to you, were they that different than other people's? Were they in line, or was he, or did he make it into the film because he clearly had this unique point of view? The people who made it into the film, I felt, were being truthful with me about what they believed. Sometimes people will say things that they think you want to hear mm-hmm. because it's, it's part of human nature, I think, to want to be liked. And the older someone gets, the less they are influenced by peer pressure and the more truthful they are to what they believe and Irvin at the time of the interview I think was about 85 and uh, very forthright and truthful about what he believed so I would always wrap up my interviews which generally lasted about two hours with questions like um, what is the greatest danger facing mankind how do we stop conflict how can we improve humanity it's like what can we do to to make things better so uh Here's Irvin's response. The common concept is education is the answer. Well, it's who does the educating and what are you educating? I could go to a religious school and be very highly educated, and I don't think it does anything to improve life for others. I think it's an egocentric thing. I think it just keeps you as a child, and thinking like a child. You don't have to observe or study or take into account science or what science is learning. You just know what the truth is. You just know how you're supposed to act. It's all written down in the good book of some sort. I don't trust any of that. All right, we're down to our last clip of the late Irvin Kirshner as interviewed by Roger Nygaard for The Nature of Existence, which is now on DVD. We want to remind you of that again. Um, now, I have to ask you before we play the clip of, uh, of Irvin on, on The Afterlife, it just occurred to me that uh, you've, uh, you've been working with Larry David during the course of making this film, I guess, uh, but he's not in the film, and yet these would seem to be topics that he would have a lot to say about. Um, what do you think that uh, Larry David, either the man or the character, would might, might say about the afterlife? <laughs> well, you know, Larry did a movie with Woody Allen about these topics. And, you know, um, it, was, it was really one of the Woody Allen movies that felt like it was an earlier style of Woody Allen movie, because I guess it was an older script mm-hmm. that he, uh, you know, uh, had in his closet. Uh, it's called Whatever Works. 
And I remember talking to Larry about that afterward. And he's very much he very much he thinks about these topics a lot. Um, I didn't. I actually did ask Larry if he would uh, be interested in doing an interview, and he turned me down, which I kind of expected, <laughs> because he doesn't like to uh, have to review anybody's work that he knows. He doesn't want to because if you watch the TV show, that's one of his things, right? You know, is interactions between people, and if you know somebody, then it can be uh, as small as like. Uh, trying to dissect, what did he mean by that? Did he is he is he upset? Is he not upset? So, it's better I think for him in his working environment if he can avoid any of those issues. And we get along great because we do avoid all those things. And you know we have we 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 laugh all the time and and have a great time making this TV show. Hmm. I'm thinking though that uh, Larry David certainly the character would be a person who doesn't have a lot of concern about the afterlife. Because if he did, <laughs> you know, he'd probably be he'd probably be uh, proceeding a little differently in life. And I'm talking about strictly the character here, folks, not Larry David, the human being who I know no- I I pretend to know nothing about. But uh, yeah, well, you know, the afterlife is if you're generally if you are staking your life on some other life after this one, mm-hmm. I feel like you're probably wasting an opportunity to maximize this life. And you're probably not fully satisfied with this life if you're hoping there'll be something better, where there's a reckoning of accounts, you mm-hmm. know, as, as uh, what heaven is supposed to be, where everything is set right. Now, whether there is or there isn't, it seems to me the best thing to do is to try to make the most of right now. And if there is, you get a bonus. <laughs> but if there isn't, you may have wasted an opportunity. Yes, there is an afterlife. The afterlife has to do with what remains in the memory of the people that you have known. And also, if you've left any work behind. Now, sometimes the work you leave behind is the good nature in people. You've affected people very well, and that you leave behind. Or, if you're an artist, you might leave some paintings yeah, that's that's pretty good. Michelangelo left a hell of a lot. He lives on. When you go stand in front of the David in the National Gallery in Florence, it's the most awesome thing in the world to say that a human being made this, and he died. But this is alive. When I go, I go. I go into the ground, and I take my place with the other bacteria in the ground. That's it. And I hope that I've made some impress on other human beings and maybe the society. And that's enough. That's plenty. Well, folks, uh, you can order the DVD of Roger Nygaard's documentary film, The Nature of Existence, at uh, great uh, uh, stores everywhere or right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. You can also learn more about the film at its website, thenatureofexistence.com, or you can find Roger and the film. Uh, You can find clips there. You can find it. You can find clips on YouTube. He's got a Twitter account. He's on Facebook. He's on Vimeo. Uh, My sense of Roger is that if there's social media out there, he's got his film with a position on it. Um, Roger, this was a lot of fun. We really appreciate you... uh, reaching into the vault and uh, sharing these clips with us uh, from uh, uh, Irvin Kirshner, the uh, director of uh, Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. And uh, thanks so much for coming back to Mr. Media. You're welcome. I thought it would be a great way to remember him, especially since what he said was, for him, the afterlife is in what you leave behind and how you're remembered. So it was a way to really remember Irvin Kirshner and, and all the wonderful things that he had to contribute. Well, uh, folks, of course, for uh, more original interviews with your favorite film directors, you can surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com, and subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, uh, a comment on today's show, or would like to advertise on Mr. Media Radio, 
email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter. It's twitter.com slash Andelman, or on Facebook, just search Mr. Media Interviews. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate you giving up a little piece of your day and coming to spend it with us. Thanks for listening. Luke Skywalker and Han Solo rescued the princess, destroyed the Death Star, but their story didn't end there. Creators of the biggest smash hit of all time bring you the next episode in the Star Wars saga, The Empire Strikes Back. The continuing story of our band of heroes, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo, C-3PO, R2-D2, and Chewbacca. And introducing Lando Calrissian. It's an epic of romance. Of heroes and villains. They cross trackless voids to unknown worlds. Galactic Odyssey against oppression. A big, new, sprawling space adventure in the Star Wars saga, The Empire Strikes Back. Coming to your galaxy next summer. Oh.